trigger warning, math, calculus, and physics. If you do like any of those, you can leave if you want. But if you do like them, then welcome to my channel, fellow psychopath. Look at this nerd. He doesn't even know how to use the newton raphson method to find a root of a function. <laughs> Alright, that's me, two years ago. Look how naive I was. I analyzed the trajectory of a Minecraft projectile and figured out a consistent way to predict its motion. I was, unfortunately, unsuccessful at the next step, though. That is, to try to make a method to calculate the angle you need to aim in order to hit a specific target. Well, I technically did it, but in a way that's like using a 12 gauge to remove a brain tumor. It's imprecise, messy, and doesn't even work in a general case. Fortunately, I am now a little bit better, and am now capable of solving this problem more elegantly. In this video, I will briefly cover what I did that time and explain the new method I used. You should have a little bit of a calculus background for this, but if you don't, you can black box some of the process along the way. Or alternatively, you watch 3 Blue one Brown series on the essence of calculus. This video is like a TLDR for the shit posts I've written down. You can download that PDF file in the description down below. Now, let us begin. A few years ago, it was the peak of online classes. Obviously, my friend and I gave no fuck and started playing Minecraft together. We were messing around with command blocks and one of us had the idea of spawning in falling blocks to track the position of an arrow. For our classes on projectile motion, we expected the resulting trajectory to be parabolic and perfectly symmetrical. However, the result was not according to the hypothesis. And so I concluded that air resistance is a factor in Minecraft projectile motion. So I set out on a quest to accurately predict the motion of a projectile. I also wanted to make some sort of formula that would tell me the angle I would need to aim for. There is going to be a lot of practical uses, such as in a bow and arrow combat, in TNT launchers, and in roller coasters in the new update. In order to formulate the formula, I'd have to first know how air resistance relates to the arrow's velocity. For instance, in real life, the drag force is directly proportional to the square of the velocity. In the case of Minecraft projectiles, I coded a plugin for a SpeedGut server that locks the velocity of an arrow at every tick. Then I use that velocity to calculate the acceleration of the arrow. By analyzing the data, I notice that the acceleration is related to the velocity in a linear fashion. For arrows, the acceleration is 1 100th of the velocity in the direction opposite to it. Other entities have different proportionality factors such as prime TNTs, which have the proportionality factor of 1 50th. To keep the calculation generally applicable, I write the proportionality factor, from that one called the drag coefficient, as the variable beta. The drag coefficient of common types of entities are listed in Appendix A of the paper that, again, you can download in the description. Now, when gravity is a factor, you simply add in the gravitational acceleration to the mix. The gravitational acceleration is a constant and depends on the type of entity in question. Arrows have the gravitational acceleration of negative 0.05 blocks per tick squared. Again, the g value of entities are listed in Appendix A. Gravity only affects the vertical axis, thus I will label the variables appropriately. That is, subscript x for the horizontal axis and subscript y for the vertical. These two equations are the equations of motion of the system. If we solve this, we can accurately predict the trajectory of a projectile given all the relevant initial conditions. So let's solve them. Acceleration is the change in velocity over time, so it is a time derivative of velocity, and we shall rewrite it as such. These two equations are differential equations that are in the form of separable differential equations. By separable, it means that you can separate the terms related to velocity to one side of the equation, and the terms related to time to the other side. We integrate both sides of the equation from time 0 to any time t. As for the velocity, we will denote the initial velocity v0. This means we will integrate the velocity from v0 to v at any time. 
Slow the video down to check the steps yourselves. Ultimately, what we end up with are these two equations. Let's look at them and see what they mean physically. For the horizontal velocity, at the beginning, t is 0, and so the value of the exponential term is 1. This checks out the velocity at time 0 is the initial velocity. On the other hand, as time goes on, the exponential term gets smaller and smaller, tending towards 0, meaning that the velocity of the horizontal axis approaches 0 as time goes on. This trend of decay is known as the exponential decay. As for the vertical velocity, the beginning is again the initial velocity. However, as time goes on, this whole term decays exponentially, and leave this time independent term. This means that the velocity gets closer and closer to this specific value as time goes on, regardless of what we started with. This specific value is the terminal velocity, which I will denote as vt. See, we've already gained a lot of information from integrating it just once. Let's do it again! Velocity is change in displacement over time, i.e. the time derivative of displacement. So let's rewrite it as that. Integrate from time 0 to any time t. Again, slow the clip down if you want to verify. What we get is this pair of equations. Looking at the first equation, let's distribute the term a little bit. In the beginning, the displacement of course is 0. Now as time goes on, the latter term goes to zero, leaving us with this term to the left. So as time goes on, the projectile tends towards this displacement, albeit never reaching it nor exceeding it. As for the vertical displacement, a similar thing happens as time goes on. This term goes to zero and leaves us with this term. This term is akin to the classic s equals vt we've all seen before. This is saying that, as time goes on, the initial velocity becomes irrelevant and the terminal velocity term dominates. If we consider the fact that there is only the magnitude of the initial velocity, and the initial velocity in each axis depends on the angle of elevation of the aim, then we can write that v naught x is v naught times cosine theta, and v naught y is v naught sine theta. And now we have it. If we were given all the parameters, then we can predict exactly where the arrow is at any time. Now, last time I ended here. The method I used afterwards was pre-calculate the projectile's position and find which positions correspond to which angle of elevation. Which means it can only calculate for one scenario, the case where the initial velocity is exactly 3, drag coefficient is exactly 0.01, and gravity is exactly negative 0.05. Any other value and it won't work. Additionally, it only works for discrete positions. There is no aiming at half blocks or quarter blocks. And since it's pre-computed, you'll have to use this giant file containing all the pre-computed data. Point is, there are lots of flaw in my formulation last time. But fret not, for I am back to fix everything. Maybe, maybe most things. Given all the initial conditions, we can know exactly where an arrow is at any time. So if we know where the arrow should be, and some of the initial conditions, we should be able to find the remaining initial conditions. And that's what we're going to do. First of all, we don't care about what happens in between the path. All we want to consider is the beginning and the end. So let's get time out of the equation, literally. In regular projectile motion, You'd express t in terms of x or y, then plug it back into the other equation. Depending on whether you express t in terms of x or y, you get one of these two equations, though they are equivalent. What we did was transform two equations in parametric form into normal form. And in Minecraft projectile motion, we do the exact same thing. Express t in terms of either x or y, and plug it back in. Of course, the equation is going to be much more complicated, but the process remains the same. We'll take the x path as it is much more straightforward compared to the y path. We begin by multiplying the equation by this guy, cancelling out these terms. Move 1 over and move the negative over. Then we take the natural log to get rid of the exponentiation, bring negative beta to this side, and now we have t in terms of x. Then we plug the expression back into the other equation. This term can be transformed into this, 
Then we quote unquote simplify the expression. Just move stuff around, exponentiate things, etc., until we end up with this equation. This is the equation that we wanted. A theta that satisfies this equation is the angle that will hit the target. For the sake of compactness, I'll pack up this whole expression and call it a function phi. This is a function of pretty much every variable related to the system. So what we have to do now is to find the theta such that phi equals zero. But how would we do that? One approach is to find the inverse of phi, that is, instead of phi as a function of theta, we find theta as a function of phi, and then we plug in phi equals zero, and we get the theta that we need. There's one problem with this approach, however. I mean, look at the function, and I don't think I can find the inverse of this abomination. So is this yet another end of the journey? Since we can't find the inverse, there, there's no way we can find the angle we need. Thus, we would have to end another video in disappointment. But that's how losers think. Formulation part 3, baby, newton raphson method to save the day. So, what's the newton raphson method? It is an iterative method that you use to find the root of a function. Being an iterative method means that you start from a certain value and, through some process, get another value that's closer to the value that you want. Then you repeat the process on the new value to get another value that is even closer. Repeat it on and on and on until you're satisfied, and you get your answer. For our case, the newton raphson method finds the root of a function. The root of a function means the value of input that would return 0. In our case, the value of theta that will make phi 0. So let's see how the method works. Let's consider an arbitrary function f of x. We take an initial guess as to where the root would be, we'll call it x0. Now, the method will approximate the function to be a linear function at x0. Because it's a linear function, it's easy to find where the value is 0. So we jump over to that value. The actual function isn't linear, so the actual value at that point isn't going to be exactly 0. But the value of x that we just jumped to, x1, is certainly closer to the answer that we want than x0. Then we repeat the process an inch closer and closer to the exact value that we want. We can stop once we are satisfied with the precision. Now that you know how it works, let's see how it's done, like, mathematically. We start off at x0, and the height is going to be f of x0. Then we draw a line tangent to the function. A linear function corresponds to the equation y equals mx plus b, right? m is a slope, which should be equal to the derivative of f at x0. We also know that the line passes the point x0 and f of x0. With this information, we can find the value of b, and thus the full equation of the approximated tangent line. We want the value of x when the line intersects the ground, which is where y equals 0. If we put it back into the tangent line's equation, it gives us that the new x, denoted x1, equals to x0 minus f of x0 over f prime of x0. This recurrent relation applies for all x's, and we can write it generally like this. I did a little bit of off-screen grinding and went ahead and took the derivative of phi for the sake of time. Now let's see the newton raphson method in action. Say, we're considering shooting an arrow with a bow to try and hit the target 50 blocks in front and 20 blocks above us. We're gonna start off with our initial guess of theta equals 0. After the first iteration, the value we get is 0 0.5723 something radians which is around 32.79 degrees. The second iteration yields us 0 0.5567 something radians, which is around 31.90 degrees. Continuing this on and on, it's clear that after the fourth iteration, the output value practically doesn't change anymore. So the answer we get is 0 0.5567 something radians, or around 31.894 degrees. With that demonstration being done, now you know how the newton raphson method works. And then put all that procedure into code, and run it twice for the two initial guesses, 0 and 89.9 degrees. 
I had also taken the derivative of phi with respect to initial velocity as well, in case the primary variable is the initial velocity instead of the angle. Here, you can see that even after over two years has passed, I still don't know how to make a GUI. Now, let's put the algorithm to the test. Here, I have the setup I had last time with a few more target blocks. I'm also going to be using other projectiles as well, such as snowballs and tridents. You can see the algorithm works 100% of the time that it works. It was a success. So what did we learn today? Well, most importantly that we learned that 16-year-old me is a nerd. We also learned that the current me is an even bigger nerd. But that aside, the main topics were distinctly separated into each section. In formulation part 1, we solve a pair of separable differential equations. By separating the terms that are a function of v to one side and of t to the other, we could integrate both sides of the equation to get the relationship between velocity and time. We then repeat the process, getting the relationship between the displacement in two axes and time. In formulation part 2, we solve the projectile motion by converting the parametric form of the equation, the form containing t, into the normal version because we don't really care about the time, we just want to know which angle is needed. We did this by expressing t in terms of x, essentially finding the inverse of the function. Then, we plugged it back into the y equation, which gives us a single time-independent equation that describes the trajectory of the projectile. If we know all the required parameters, we can find the values of angle that satisfy the equation, and that is the value we need to aim at. In formulation part 3, we use the newton raphson method to find such theta. By making an initial guess and approximating the function p linear at that point, we can find the approximated value of zero would be. The actual value isn't zero yet, but the new point is certainly closer to zero than the previous point. We repeat the process and get closer and closer to the desired value. This is the newton raphson method. Afterwards, I put all of this into code and we tested out how effective the method is. The first video was made when I was still in high school, and I'd actually consider it one of the major choices I made that led me to where I am now, because I am now in university, majoring in physics. As the equations are satisfied, so am I. This quote-unquote study has been in the back of my mind ever since I started it, and honestly, it feels relieving finally doing it right. It started off as such a simple observation and later grows into these equations. Admittedly, these equations are messy, but I can't help but find it appealing when I get to visualizing them. Although it is a human nature to find complexity in nature, we are often rewarded with the beauty found within it. I'm glad you watched this video to the end. I hope this video was either educational or entertaining to you. Maybe it gives you a slight motivation for you to learn some math and physics, or motivated you to play Minecraft. I don't know. Anyhow, thank you for watching and see you next time.